Hello my friends and welcome once more to this Red Gamer Tech video of myself, Amata. I hope you guys are having a good day. Just a quick note, I am still using RTX Voice for this video, but with the settings basically turned down so much that if I turn it down anymore it would basically be off. Um, so hopefully that is sorted now, but do let me know your thoughts in the comments. Anyway, as always I am here with the latest news from the tech world as of the 30th of May. We're going to begin today's proceedings with some benchmarks for Intel's XE DG1. So this is a Firestrike benchmark which has been helpfully tweeted by Appysank over on Twitter of course. And you can find his tweet linked in the description below this video. So we do see a fairly low score here of 5538 which does bring it below the Radeon RX 560 and 1050 tie but... There's a reason that this is not really a big deal at all. This benchmark is doing the rounds a lot today. And I just kind of want to go, hold up, hang on a minute. Intel have made this extremely clear that this product is never actually going to launch. It's literally a software development vehicle. If you look at the pictures of the card, it even says that on it. And Intel made it clear that this is literally just for people to get used to the architecture. It's not actually a product that's going to release, so of course it has low performance numbers. It's not intended to deliver performance that's going to rival the 2080 tie or whatever. So I just wanted to highlight this because I've seen this benchmark doing the rounds and everyone going, Oh my god, the bad performance! And I'm like, Intel have not could not have been clearer about the purpose of DG1, but that's just me. Anyway, we're going to move on now to... Another set of benchmarks for Intel, this time for Elkhart Lake. And this is Appysack again, he's a very busy fellow over the last few days. And of course, again, you can find this tweet linked alongside all the other links you're undoubtedly going to see there. So this is once again a Firestrike benchmark, and we can also see some specifications for Elkhart Lake here as well. Uh, four cores, four threads coming in at 1.9 gigahertz uh, with a score of 571 and then a time spy score of 170. Now obviously Elk Heart Lake Elk Heart Lake excuse me is a low power SOC but even with that in mind this is probably still early silicon so we can most likely expect uh, these performance numbers to improve uh, when the product actually you know comes out and is a real thing that you can hold in your hands. But still, always nice to get a little sort of early look see, a little bit of a peek as to sort of performance and benchmarks that we can expect from the finalised products. Now these are not the only benchmarks I have for you today my friends, no no no, it's a very benchmark rich video today. But we do have some Ryzen benchmarks up next. Now these are for various U-series parts, so these are Lenovo ThinkBooks. We have the 4800U, 4700U and 4500U all being used with 16 gigabytes of RAM. But we have Rogame this time to thank for tweeting these benchmarks out. You can of course find it linked below. But we do have various Geekbench results to actually get through. So let's begin of course at the top of the stack with the 2800U. And we do see a single core score of 5022 and a multi core score of 23089. In terms of the specifications, 8 cores, 16 threads, base frequency of 1.8, and then max showing as 4.29. As for the 4700U, the single core score is 4927, and the multi core score is 21755. Specs is just 8 cores, base frequency of 2 GHz, and a max of 4.19. As for the final one on our list, which of course is the Ryzen 5 4500U, we do see a single core score of 4822 and a multi core score of 19,435. In terms of specifications, we can of course see six cores here 2.38 GHz base and 3.99 GHz uh, max frequency. And interestingly enough, someone actually responded to Rogame's tweet basically saying that these are already up for pre-sale on Lenovo China. But let's give these results some context, shall we? Let's have a look at some 
Intel parts, that's this, that being the Ryzen 4800U, the top end of the stack here, will be competing against. The first benchmark that I was able to find was the Intel i7-1065G7, 4 cores, 8 threads, uh, base frequency of 1.5 and max of 3.5. Uh, the single core score was 3916 and the multi core score was 14891. But we can also look at a part such as the i7-10710U, uh, which is 6 cores, 12 threads, base frequency of 1.61 and max of 4.67. And the score there for the single core is 4774, and then the multi-core is 16837. Now obviously those are just a couple of results versus the result, of course, that Rogue Game helpfully uh, provided with us, for us, sorry, should I say, today. But it does paint a very interesting picture that has remained fairly consistent over all of the benchmarks and stuff that we have seen. That Ryzen 4000 is just doing very, very well versus Intel's 10th generation. But we're going to move on to our last topic of today, which is some snippets, very interesting comments from Jim Ryan of Sony who had an interview with gamesindustry.biz. Now I will of course link the full interview in the description below this video, I would highly suggest you give it a read, because uh, they cover a lot of stuff that I'm not really going to mention in this video. The thing I want to focus on here is his comments regarding the launch of the PS5. Now again, there has been various rumours swirling that Sony were going to have issues um, meeting demand of the PlayStation 5 when it launches this year, and there were even rumours of potential delays and stuff like that. Now obviously both Sony and Microsoft have been keen to say no, that isn't the case, and now Jim Ryan has once again uh, spoken on this. Now he says, quote, it's been a roller coaster of a year. We realized a couple of months ago that we were going to have to spend a lot more time paying attention to the PS4 community than we had anticipated as that community, along with everybody else in the world, went into lockdown. We have devoted a lot of effort into making sure our network works. We are going to get The Last of Us Part 2 out at the end of the next month, and we're going to get Ghost of Tsushima out the month after that, and both with only small delays, and really there were delays that were born out of complete uncertainty about the distribution scenario when we had to pull the trigger. It was like the world was heading into this big black hole, and we didn't know whether the internet would be working, we didn't know whether warehouses would be able to operate, so we took a cautious approach, but the games are ready to go, and we are feeling really good about them. But we were obviously principally occupied with getting ready for PlayStation 5. I think most businesses would find themselves challenged with the working from home environment and I do think the way that the various groups within PlayStation have responded has been magnificent. There are hardware engineers who are having to work without being able to get into China where PS5 will be assembled. That's kind of tough. The software engineers who are building these great, fe these great features, who are building a great PS5 UI, some of that can readily be done in isolation. But when it comes to putting it all together, that's not easy to do remotely, and they're doing a great job. And finally, the people who make games. We and our partners seem to be coping really well, and so we're on track. We are going to launch this holiday, and we are going to launch globally. We're looking, re we're really looking forward to it, sorry, and it's going to be a blast. Now you may recall that the last time the GamesIndustry.biz actually spoke to Jim Ryan, he obviously touched on the transition between the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5, and he said at the time that it would be happening, quote, at a scale and pace that we've never delivered before. And according to Jim, that ambition is still in place, even with obviously everything that's going on in the world right now and all of the potential effects that it could have in the future. But that the recession that we have seen the possibility of kind of banded around by various experts and so on. And he said, quote, I think the best way we can address this is by providing the best possible value proposition that we can. I don't necessarily mean lowest price. Value is a combination of many things. In our area, it means games, it means number of games, depth of games, breadth of games, quality of games, price of games. All these things and how they avail themselves of the feature set of the platform. Add a quote, I think that's the most times I've said the word games in a, in a paragraph before. That was a pretty, pretty impressive there, Jim. But... In all seriousness, they seem pretty confident that they can handle, obviously, the launch, and the, they seem confident, at least in their first-party releases, being able to be released. Now, obviously, we did see a slight delay with The Last of Us 2, but it was only slight, and from what Jim has said, it literally was just because everything was so uncertain at that time. 
and they didn't want to release the game and basically have no one be able to play it because you know all the shops are shut and that sort of thing. Now obviously that is still the case in a lot of countries but obviously there is still distribution centers such as Amazon and other websites and services that are local to your country. So they're obviously counting on that, plus, of course, digital distribution. Uh, I'm not going to lie, when it came to Final Fantasy VII, just for example, I had to pay digitally from the PSN store, which I basically, that's the first time I've ever done that, because I personally prefer to have the physical game in my hands. And also, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way that a digital product is more expensive, even though I'm technically getting less because I don't get the case and the disc and everything. Not that you get a manual or anything these days, but still, it's more expensive to get less. And that's not even just exclusive to Sony, that's just the case across the board. Anyway, so yeah, I had to buy it digitally because literally nowhere had it. And we're probably going to see something similar, unfortunately, with The Last of Us 2, but I'm sure Sony are aware they can't keep waiting and waiting and waiting to release this game. It's obviously a game that they spent many multiple millions uh, developing, alongside Naughty Dog, of course. And obviously people have been waiting for it for a really long time. So it's obviously going to have to come out, and it's going to have to sell as well as it can in the current circumstance but when the ps5 comes out later on this year we may or may not see some sort of version for it on the on that console and even if it doesn't i'm sure there'll be like a second breath of life for that you know as one rushes to buy games and stuff for christmas and blah 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 so long story short from all of this is that sony seem very confident that we are going to be seeing Sony, uh, sorry, they definitely are going to be releasing the PlayStation 5 this holiday, and they're going to do it globally, so they're not even restricting it, like, oh, we're going to do this country, then this country, or we're just going to do the US, UK, and Europe, and then perhaps leave the other countries for a bit later. So that also tells me that they're very confident about their supply levels as well, because they would not be launching globally if they didn't believe they could actually supply that many consoles to that many places at the same time. Obviously, whether or not people will be able to afford it due to what's the ramifications, what's going on at the moment, it's impossible to say. I'm not willing to speculate on that. Now, another thing that Jim Ryan also discussed was the possibility of making PlayStation 5 games compatible with the PlayStation 4. Now, obviously, the PS4 is going to keep going for, for some time after the PS5 launches, um, but it does seem that Sony doesn't have that much interest in making them compatible. So he said, quote, We have always said that we believe in generations. We believe that when you go to all the trouble of creating a next-gen console, that it should include features and benefits that the previous generation does not include. In our view, people should make games that can make most of those features, whether it's the DualSense controller, whether it's the 3D audio, whether it's the multiple ways that the SSD can be used. We are thinking that it is time to give the PlayStation community something new, something different, something that can only be enjoyed on PlayStation 5. Now obviously this doesn't mean that they're just going to abandon the PS4's uh, install base, and he did himself stress that. He said, quote, We have always felt that we had a responsibility to serve the PS4 community for several years after the launch of PlayStation 5. The numbers are quite straightforward. If you say in broad brush figures that we have a community of 100 million PS4 owners right now, and in the first couple of years, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 25 million might migrate to PS5, that still leaves a huge number of people with PS4s, and that communi community is demonstrating an amazing stickiness and willingness to stay engaged that I think the, the events of the past few months have just reinforced what we knew already. So obviously they're still going to continue to be supporting the PS4, they're not silly, they're obviously going to know that that install base is not going anywhere anytime soon and that has been the case with the last few generations on both sides in fairness where you will see a bit of crossover between the generations as people inevitably make the choice of whether or not to upgrade to the PS5 or the Xbox Series X to be fair or to just to decide to opt out entirely until uh, either console comes down in price. And obviously there's always a possibility that someone might decide instead to go over to PC uh, if the price is not to their liking or if perhaps they've been thinking about making the switch over for some time. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how this plays out for them given how Microsoft have been uh, saying how much they're going to be supporting the Xbox Series X and the Xbox One as we move into the next generation. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Of course, you can find everything I've discussed linked in the description. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is very much appreciated by both myself and Paul. Do give us a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.